Malaysia Technology and Innovation Division CIDB Malaysia Yang Berusaha Engineer Tuan Haji Mokhtar Che Ali General Manager of Shack Division CIDB Malaysia Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen A very good morning, Salam Sejahtera dan Salam Satu Malaysia On behalf of the Organising Committee it gives me great pleasure in extending a warm welcome to all of you to this intellectual discourse platform jointly organized by the Construction Research Institute of Malaysia, CREAM in short, CIDB Malaysia and the University Technology Mara. The event, as you all know, is held in conjunction with the International Construction Week 2013. To kickstart our morning session, we have a welcoming address followed by the first session of papers. To deliver the welcoming address, may I cordially invite Yang Baru Seher, Professor Engineer Dr. Roslan Hassan, the Member of Board of Trustees, Green, Professor Roslan. Terima kasih pengurusi majlis. Yang berusaha Cik Mokhtar Cik Ali, pengurus besar Safety Health and Environment. Secretariat and uh, Organizing Committee Members. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning to all. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome all of you to the third Construction Industry Research Achievement International Conference or CIRAC 2013. This year marks the third biennial conference jointly organized by CIDB, CREAM and University Technology Mara. CREAM is committed in ensuring the continuity of this conference in promoting R&D to the construction fraternity in Malaysia. I urge all participants here to take the opportunity to, to use this platform as to network, initiate collaboration and leverage on the R&D efforts to make the output of the R&D works not only being recognized and applied by the industry, but brings about benefit to the society at large. This year's conference features diversity of topics under the theme Integrated Sustainable Village and Housing. Topics that will be covered include Sustainable Village, Green Building Design, Solar Power, Rainwater Harvesting, Sustainable Materials and Sustainable Hill Slope Development. This is in line with the shift towards sustainable development, which is the most important and challenging task that the engineering and construction world need to embark on. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is currently facing the inevitable issues pertaining to sustainable development. Environmental impacts stem from problems caused by climate change, energy issues, overpopulation, to name a few, requires a holistic approach coupled with strong collaborative efforts from multiple resources to provide creative solutions urgently. A joint collaboration by CIDB, CREAM, Forest Research Institute of Malaysia, FRIM, National Hydraulic Research Institute of Malaysia, Nahrim, Solar Energy Research Institute, Surrey, and University Putra, Malaysia, which are embarking on sustainable R&D projects, is one such example of a good effort to tackle the above-mentioned challenges. This conference is, con is conducted to allow for the sharing of information, exchanging ideas, comparing of knowledge and latest technologies, 
among those with interest in the same issues which will help each individual and organization to face these challenges. Through this conference, it is our hope that we hope that we can foster the spirit of sustainable development for individuals, organizations, and communities, which can be fostered so that we can build a sustainable environment for the better future. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased to have a list of distinguished and renowned guest speakers with us today, and the papers will touch on various areas of interest for our delegates. The two parallel discussion sessions tomorrow will be focusing on sustainable village and affordable house and sustainable hill slope development policies. It will discuss various areas of interest such as zero energy house, rainwater harvesting, solar panel, current policy on hill slopes development management and other related topics. I wish to express our sincere gratitude to our, to our invited speakers for taking time off from their busy schedule to be with us today and tomorrow, a testimony of their commitment to the development of knowledge. I would also like to take, to take this opportunity to thank all those who have contributed to the success of this international conference. Without their unwearing commitment, untiring efforts, and staunch support, this conference would not have been realized. Your presence will help us benchmark our knowledge on the global platform. It will not be complete if I do not register my utmost appreciation to our partners, CIDB and UITM, for all the hard work put in. Finally, my gratitude goes to all of you for, participa for participating in this conference. I hope this conference will fulfill your quest for more knowledge let us make this conference a fruitful, a fruitful and enjoyable one that enhances our knowledge and develop permanent bonds. Let us begin here today the process of nurturing global partnership in building the knowledge for the future. Once again, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Prof. Roslan, for those words of encouragement. Moving on, to begin the morning session of paper presentation, we have with us Engineer Mokhtar Che Ali, the session moderator for this morning. Can I request uh, Engineer Mokhtar on stage to, to start the session? As he takes the stage, just a bit of background on Engineer Mokhtar Che Ali. He is the General Manager of Safety, Health, Environment and Quality Division Tech at CIDB Malaysia. Uh, graduated in 82 with the Bachelor's of Engineering from UPM. He holds a Master's in Engineering Construction from UTM. He is also a Certified Project Management Professional PMP. He has been in industry since 1982 till present and has held various positions in CIDB as well as other organizations. He is a member of the BEM as well as a corporate member of IEM. With that short but interesting introduction. I, the floor is yours, Jane Mukta. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. MC. Um, alaikum and a very good morning. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will start our first uh, presentation this morning with the first speaker. Uh, before that, uh, allow me to shortly introduce our uh, distinguished speaker for the first session. Uh, his name is uh, Engineer Dr. Gui Sui Yu, graduated from three universities, diploma in civil engineering from uh, UTM, first class uh, degree from University of Stretch like in UK, and he obtained his uh, doctorate from Oxford University with a Foundation Scholarship. 
Later, he pursued his uh, honorary doctorate in science in the year 2006 from University, again from Stradlite, Glasgow, Scotland. He is now MD for GMP Geotech Sindhemrahat and the Chief C CEO of GP Professionals Sindhemrahat. And uh, he has been very active in participating in various committees. Um, he is uh, including, uh, he is one of the committee members for the Highland Towers, uh, you know, a collapse of the Highland Towers. And uh, he is also currently the uh, panel of, uh, no, he is one of the advisory panel for Hillside Development in Penang. And he is the current representative of the World Federation of Engineering Organization, WFEO, to the, Inter to the International Consortium on Landslides. And, and currently, very recently, he is the chairman of the Expert Standing Committee on Slope Safety for CIDB because of the new, because of many slope, you know, this, uh, landslide, all this thing. So CIDB have uh, formed a uh, high level expert committee which is chaired by Dr. Gui. He has presented almost 221 lectures on geotech and published and publish 110 technical papers related to geotech engineering. And with that short note, I would like to invite Dr. Gui to make his presentation. Thank you for the kind introductions. Very good morning to all of you. Well, you may not see the paper in your bag, simply because I was given very short notice uh, to be a speaker of this conference. But you get the PowerPoint. So the PowerPoint, you can have it. If you don't get it, let me know. You can actually uh, download from our website. Right, can I have the PowerPoint? Because when they were first invited, I said, you have to prepare your paper within two weeks. Conference in one month, I said, thank you very much. I can't do it. Because I have to steal time for my job to prepare the paper. But finally, he said, no, no, you don't have to prepare a paper. You just give a presentation. OK, now, if you look at here, that uh, this is the title, Some Lesson Learned. Next one. So this is the content what I'm going to talk about major landslide to show you some of the major landslide. Why are they? The causes. So this is causes of a groups of landslide, about 50 of them. So give you the causes of landslides and some lessons learned from there. And the topic of today, we are talking about the, uh, the way forward. How to, what I call, ensure sustainability in hillside development. So that are the four main things that I'm proposing. Cluster development, centralized body to help the local authority. We have 146 local authority and improve guidelines. There are some guidelines never talk about safety, talk about rules, talk about policy. Here, there is a guideline I'm going to introduce to you. They talk very specifically on safety improvement. And what about the old, I, I use the word old uh, slopes rather than existing slopes because some of the existing slopes are up to the current standards, but there are many old slopes, question marks. So that's the area that uh, we want to uh, take notice of and then take actions. Now let's look at some of the major landslides on residential commercial project developments. So there are two big groups. One is the residential and commercial. The other one's for highway. They're different. Why they're different? Because nobody can see them up in the jungle. Whereas the residents one, you see them every day. So those, you have a lot of people monitoring the slope. So there's big difference. Let's look at some of the major landslides. Okay, this is the very f first one that actually uh, shake, uh, not that shake, the, the very few landslides, uh, the hillside development, Taman Malawati. Next one. 
There are quite a lot of developments about maybe more than two decades away, three decades now. Next one. This is the one that shocked us. 48 death, Highland Tower. And then to, to the same place, 8 death, Tan Sri Ismail's house. Uh, get, go a bit slow. 8 death. A bit surprised because after the Highland Tower, it was condemned. The slopes has been condemned, not safe. And this bungalow is built at the foothill. And of course, the slopes that we have condemned in the investigation of the Highland Tower came down and buried eight persons. Next. Well, I want to show you some. It looks one boom. Less than six meters, it fell. Why? Because it's too steep. Very straightforward. 45 degrees. So when you see 45 degrees soil slope, not rock slope, huh? soil slope, it can be dangerous. Next. Look at this one. Kampung Basir, 206. Next. Four deaths. Putrajaya. These are actually quite recent. Recent in the sense, maybe at that time, it was about a few years after the construction. 45 degree slopes, soil slopes. Look at number of cars that buried. So don't park your car next to slope. Unless you know that slope is safe. Next. Look at this one. This one is the, supposed to be a government resort. But the owner refused to take possession. He said, Takut. They're scared because they see a lot of creeping movement. And of course, he came down, came down before anybody occupied. And that is very interesting. When we investigated, I was one of the committee members. And that project, everybody almost, first time. First time designing this, first time the architect, first time the engineer, the contractor also first time. Everybody first time. But some of the things the first time is dangerous. Nature thing first time, instinct tells you you can do it. But not on slope. See? Don't park your car too close to slope. Next one. And in Sabah. And this one. This one killed 16th, if I remember. An orphanage home. And the local authority says that we have no power to control the developments in his area. That's very strange. I thought the law says that any development within the local authority, he has the power to control. But there was a statement, I hope that the statement is quoted wrongly or reported wrongly by the media. And how can that you cannot control? Next one. This is the most recent one. Anchor slope. But a geologist, there's a professor says this is granite slope. Can you imagine? They don't even know it's a granite slope. It's an anchor slope. Call a granite slope. And propose a remedial solution. I say this is crazy. It's just like get a chemist to operate a person. He's a geologist. And he's definitely stretched beyond his boundary of practice, see, giving the wrong diagnosis and giving wrong remedial proposal. Well, you can see that how to recognize whether it's anchor slopes on the right hand side. They're supposed to open that casing. If you look at the code on ground anchors, you're supposed to maintain initially the first few years, every six months. You have to restress because it's creeping. That's the requirement under the standards. So is that sustainable? Getting somebody to uh, actually go and monitor and restress them every six months. And this is 55, 60 meters slope. So sustainability, you must make something that's very easy to maintain. Okay, let's move away from Malaysia to look at other country. Are we the only country that have a lot of landslides? The answer is no. There are many, many countries that have more landslides than us, more casualties than us. Mumbai. 
India. Next one. Rich country, California. Look at that, the swimming pool. Okay, LA. Look at that swimming pool. So it is very expensive area. If you don't do it carefully, it can. It doesn't matter which country, develop, developing country, and so on. Next. So let's look at the infrastructures. Just now we talk about residents, those that people can actually monitor them every day behind your house, in front of a house. Okay, now look at the major infrastructures. Cameron Highlands, look at the road disappeared. Next one. This highway, expressway, closed for six months. Major expressway, you know? Next. There's another part of the expressway. You've got the mudslides that have one death and damaged the bridge. Okay, next one. So this is a very common one. People just taking the soil from the bottom up instead of from the top down. Make it very steep. You don't need the engineers to say that there's wrong practice. Look at this, how steep it is. Next one. So this is also very recent. In Hululangan. Next. So there's a little bit more roads to say that looks the roads are have different problems. This is in Klantan. Next. Look at the side. You can see that the uh, one area they have the drain, but the drain is hanging. Subsoil drain, I mean. This after the failure, of course, then you can see the subsoil drain. One side, because the subsoil drain, the other side don't have. It must be terminating at the fuel area. Next. Let's look at the causes of landslide in these two categories. Near the residential area and the road. Next. Okay, now if you look at the summary, this is published. This is in the National Slope Master Plan. It's also being uh, mentioned. And this has been audited. If you look at the, uh, on the left-hand side, that is for the residential and commercial developments. On the right-hand side, look at the design error of, for the uh, residential commercial, 60%. Frankly speaking, a lot of them no design. So they are categorized, they should have done the design, prescriptive design. Very little soil investigation. Sometimes investigation done, but never used because there is no parameters. They have boreholes, but no strength parameters, no water tables, and so on. Okay, the second category, if you look carefully, is if you look the constructions error, I want you to look at the maintenance. If you look at the maintenance, the color is actually 6% for the residential, the maintenance part, simply because the residents monitor them. And the contractor, quite happy, they say, ah, oh, my is only 6%. But if you look at a category that both design and construction, that is another 20%. So now I want you to compare with the second category of the uh, failure, that is for roads and highway. And the statistics are so close to 50 of them. Design 34%, as again 60%. Okay, not too happy, the contractors are careful. The construction part, you have 18%. The maintenance is 29%, much, much higher than the residential one. Simply because right in the jungle, the highway, nobody can see. The toe of the slopes, midway the slopes, it has been eroded. But nobody, the grass cutter, yes, public cut at the top, Bottom, they didn't cut. So this is the major difference between these two classes. They're different. The maintenance part for the highway one is very high. Next. Maintenance. A simple maintenance like this. It can cause a spilling of water when it rains. Next. Look at these activities. When you talk about others, the activities, people could be lo loading on the top of the slope or cutting. Next. 
Okay, let's sum up the uh, causes of failure. When you talk about design, they are prescriptive design, meaning to say they don't do detailed design. Why? Sometimes they don't have the parameters. They got a bohos, but no data. Okay, and simply because they don't, the lack of understanding. Or they have one design for 10 kilometer, 20 kilometer of roads, for instance. But the materials are different. The properties are different. How can you have one design for all? Constructions, the quality control by the contractors. Yes. But aren't they the people ask, the consultant is supposed to supervise the work. What happened to the consultant? So down, you see, the uh, people are more le legalistic. They want to sue the contractor. They want to sue the engineer as well. You see, under the law, you're supposed to supervise. How come you allow poor quality? How come you simply say, somebody says that that's, they're dumping? How can you allow dumping? And they are now, we are involved with the uh, ex expert witness in two court cases related to compaction. Cracks, failure due to compaction. Say, ah, I'm going, to I'm going to first sue the contractor because they didn't do a proper compaction. Then you say, okay, what about developer? Their agent. Contractors are their agents. The consultants, they are consultants. They're going to sue the consultant as well. What happened to the developer? Because most of the project, the developers, after the project, they close down. They set up a subsidiary of the company and probably they escape. Unless some of the developer is still using the uh, parent company to set up a, a development company for that part project. Communications, the lack of communications between the people supervising, working, and the office. Meaning to say that the designer, the people supervising the work, don't communicate enough with the designer. Because there are a lot of assumptions during the design but in construction, it could be different. But there was no alert of differences between the people at the site and the design office. But obviously, the design office, uh, the uh, supervising team says, well, the designer should have briefed me what are the assumptions. You say, I don't know what are the assumptions. OK, site supervision, we mentioned that. It ha in the law space, it's very clearly, you design, you must supervise. Unless, of course, you get exempted. Somebody else taking over your job. Now, let's look at some more examples specifically to the roads. Next. Lesson learned. Okay, do you want to build roads on the area that can see a lot of failures? Yes, engineering why you can. There's nothing to stop you. But do you want to do that? More costly in terms of investigation, more costly in terms of uh, constructions and more costly in maintenance. That's not sustainable. It can. No problem. You go to Hong Kong, you look at the houses up in the slope. But if you have a choice, you can spend less money in the capital cost and maintenance. Wouldn't it be better? Now, let's look at here. You can see that abuse, as I mentioned about, abuse of the prescriptive design. Meaning to say, they just say cut once to one. That's, you can do that 20 years ago. You probably escape. Feel one, one is to 1.5 or one is to two. You look at the right hand side. Clearly why they said there's a difference? Because it failed. Then make it gentle on the right hand side. On the left hand side, it's steeper slope. It failed on the left hand side. So it has to design based on the property of the material. That's one very obvious one. And plus, of course, other parameters. Look at this drainage. The cascading drains and at the fuel area. Is that a good choice? Why can't we have a cascading drain before the fuel? Wouldn't it be better? Because a lot of water coming down from the catchment. Divert them before reaching the field. Next. Look at this. We have found that there is no sum. It's just let it spill over 
Very simple. You don't need an engineer to tell you. But that was not highlighted. And you have to, of course, introduce a catch pitch or the sum. Next. You can see this. On the left hand side, that blue arrow, it is going into the fuel area, the cascading drain. That should actually tap it before the fuel area. If represented by the big uh, blue line there. Next. Technology available. LIDAR survey. Make use of them. They give you the estimates, the area of the catchments, the topography. It's very difficult to get the survey right in the jungle. Because surveyor don't do survey. Who do the survey? The diploma surveyor with the diploma degree, they say that they do probably uh, a week, two weeks, a few months. They come back to the office already. They, they don't want to do. Certificate one probably do one year. So end up, who do the survey? The dropout. Poorly trained doing the survey. And we have tough time to get people to do a, a survey. We have people go back to the site six times, we have a case, to get the cross-section right. LIDAR survey helps you. Of course, LIDAR survey in area that the laser cannot go through the, the vegetations, that would be an issue. But otherwise, these techniques they give very good results. And that's particularly good for assessments of the root selections, the catchment, and so on. And here to say that, look, it can actually helps the hydrologists to estimate the amount of water coming down. It's like this is very friendly, a cascading drain coming down for people to inspect and maintain. Now let's look at the way forward. How do we solve these problems? So my suggestion is cluster development. What I mean is cluster, instead of cutting the whole hill, maybe the plain area, can we do the plain area 50%? Capital cost reduce, maintenance cost reduce, but the developers say, well, oh, difficult to sell. People want landed property. They don't want condo. So when you talk about cluster, chances is that you've got to go a high rise. But leave the difficult slopes, spend less money on strengthening the slopes and maintenance, cluster them. Okay? This is what I talk about. Go back to that slide to sound. And the second one, centralized body to help the local authority. A lot of developments are actually in the local authority. We have 146 of them. Almost all of them, if not uh, most of them, have the difficulty of finding experts. They don't have the experts on slopes to evaluate new submission, to assess the old slopes, substandard slopes. They don't have the capacity. They don't have the capability. And this is where the central agency will be very useful, like Hong Kong, very successful in this. I want to show you some example of Hong Kong. And then improve guidelines. We have guidelines. The first one started in Slango. Of course, we have many guidelines confusing. Some of them contradict one another. Slango is the first one to try to consolidate them into one, but not talking about safety of slope. We want improvement of the safety guidelines. And Vilaya follows suit with more policy, but they allow class three development. And the third one is Penang. Penang is the one that have a lot of inputs on safety. They are not talking about policy. They talk about safety, engineering of slope, incorporation, a lot of attributes on safety. You go to the internet, you just type safety guideline 2012. You can find a soft copy. Penang safety guideline 2012. You can get it on the line. Of course, what about the, those substandard slopes? Because after the Highland Tower, there was a lot of improvements in terms of practice of the slope management. What about those before that? Next. This is what I call cluster development. Leave the hill. But that doesn't mean the hill is stable. So the Dato James formed the charge 
uh, set for the uh, Highland Tower case that it is the engineer's responsibility to ensure that the adjacent slope, not the slope of your developer, you are still responsible to ensure that it doesn't come down. Because who else knows better? You are putting a tower next to the slope, either a natural slope or somebody else's land. I think that judgment by Dr. James Fong says that you have the responsibility to at least investigate the slope next to your development. Who else is more qualified? Need to do that? You. So that uh, case of precedence uh, make it very clear that if you're an engineer, sorry, you are responsible to check. Next. Okay, cluster development has the advantage of maintaining the green. Concentrates on a small area. Next area. Low maintenance cost, I mentioned, because it's a small area that you are actually building. And more residents. Instead of bungalow, only a few uh, rich person can actually enjoy the huge slope. But if you have a condo, more people can enjoy it. Next. So these type of developments. You see, originally the developer want to develop the whole hill at the back. But finally they say, well, that's very tough, expensive. So let's cluster them to the lower, uh, what I call, gentle gradients. But engineer must also check that the slopes behind the developments are safe. Next. If not, obviously they have to strengthen them. So I was asked a question in Penang. What happens that the neighbors say, don't come to my land? You want to strengthen? Strengthen in your area. I won't allow you to come unless you buy over two, three times the market price. So the decision is, if you cannot work together with your neighbor, no development. If you can strengthen on your own side, fine. Okay, now let's look at a centralized body. I mentioned that... Uh, support the local authority, they mainly support the 146 local authority. What about other small agency? Public works, they have a lot of engineers. What about small ministry? And the advantage of this, you can actually uh, recruit engineers. So like Penang, they are recruiting an, an experts from Hong Kong, part-time. He's a retired, uh, just recently retired from the geo office. Uh, hopefully, we'll come to Penang for what I call every two weeks. He will come to Penang, go back two weeks, and come back again to help the what I call this geotechnical uh, office in Penang. And these centralized bodies can actually mirror, mirror like Hong Kong's geo office. Very successful. I'll show you how successful they are. Next one. So the advantage, efficient use of human resources. Enhance the capacity and capability of slope management. And there is a multiplying effect of improving local practice. They can do R&D. And this is the, the topic of, or the theme of this conference. Allow R&D in a very structured manner. Next. So let's look at some Hong Kong experience. So they control, uh, so they control the private project through the statutory authority. And of course, the government, when they spend money to strengthen the slopes, uh, they review the submissions. Ah, this is what we hope the central body had helps the local authority to review. Of course, the power still rested with the uh, local authority. But in terms of approval, audit geotechnical constructions, audit supervision quality, and we look at the Hong Kong experience, and unfortunately, many countries also have. You see, they look at the chart here, the pre and post construction. If you look at the big bar chart there, Samoping, in 1972, it collapsed. But that doesn't trigger the formation of Geo. It has to be a repeat failure in 1976, same place. Our Highland Tower, we've got one failure in 1993, 2002, and recently we have, not recently, it's quite a few years ago. So we need another failure before the, uh, what I call, main stakeholder, the government, take actions. That's very unfortunate. It's worldwide. It's not known in Malaysia. But because we are hot for a short while, 
did Malay proverb say, Tang, uh, hanga, hanga, tai ayam. They are hot for a while, after that they're forgotten. No action taken. And that's where the reason why CIDB formed an expert a committee. Okay, you can look at here that it is after the second failure, much less casualty, and the government realized that they must do something. Next one. And this is what they did. If you look at the curve, uh, before the blue line, if you do nothing, the casualties and the failure will continue. So the first thing they do was try to flatten that new development. Very stringent approval for new development. That's the first category. Meaning to say, they minimize the risk on the extreme right on new development. Checked new slopes and land use planning. Control land use planning. And the second category, the red color one, they upgrade the old substandard slopes. So that's basically what they are doing. The third one, of course, the uh, squatters area. They, we saw that the 16 deaths in Hululangat, the orphanage home, they call it the squatters area. But it doesn't look like squatter home. Those are the modern home. Okay, so that is how successful Hong Kong able to achieve. But they still have landslide. Yes, but very small compared to the old. So what we see, you can mitigate. Total prevention, maybe not. Mitigation, definitely yes. Next. Okay, let's look at some of these uh, further improvement can be done on policy. What happened to private slopes? The owners say, like for instance, the Highland Tower, and the bank who owns most of the land say, look, we have no plan. Despite the local authority, how about we allow development so that you can strengthen the slope. Again, you say, we have no plan. But with this law, similar to Hong Kong, you can force the develop, uh, owner. If the owner don't have the money, for whatever reason, they want to do, you can strengthen them and cavet the land. They cannot sell, they cannot develop. When they want to sell, when they want to develop, they have to pay the penalty, pay the cost, plus interest. I think that will work. So first thing we talk about policy, Next one. And sec next one is uh, undergraduate module R. This is where the university can help. Get the industry to tell you what the industry needs on slope engineering. And then, of course, the industry also must provide structure training. Next one. For the practitioner, IEM, for instance, ACM can help organize courses for the practitioner. R&D, and this is where the central body can actually help to do R&D, plus the university to for cooperate. Construction quality control and slope maintenance. Let's look at a little bit more on policy. So the, the middle one, the right in the center, ensures sustainability. That's designed easier to maintain. That's very important. Safety enhancement. The second one, slope stability and protections in various practice. Make it environmental friendly, green the area, because people don't like the sentence slopes, but see you with anchor, not anchor slopes, the soy nail slopes, granite slopes. Okay, and we hope that there will be a role of unifying the policy and legislation to make it easier to practice within the country. Next. Improve guidelines, as I mentioned. Uh, guidelines, a lot of them just talk about policy, setback buffer zone, but not on engineering safety. Next, if you look at the first one, the Selengo, Vilaya, and the third one is Penang. So the Penang one is the only one that talk about improving safety and not talking about policy. Policy, leave it to the uh, policy, the planner, and so on. Next. So this is a classification. Make it very simple. We do not want a classification that 10 percent, you got 10 different answers. Class one, you will look at the Slango and, and the Vilaya one. Class one, can we become class three? Because if you see erosion features, so I ask the question, what do you mean by erosion features? Flat ground also you got erosion features. So therefore, if I don't like your face, class one become class three. No, we do not want that sort of, we are talking about here, not engineering yet. Talk about planning. Next. Okay, 
continuous improvement. So therefore, uh, where after the uh, forum in Selangor that we commented on the guidelines that has no what they call safety features on engineering safety, he said, yeah, yeah, okay, we're going to look at it, we're going to review. But, but I don't, I'm not aware that they're actually inviting people to review that guidelines, it's still there. Okay, then it says, it must be easy, easily understood, transparent, and have safety information. That should be the main essence of the guideline. Thanks. Okay, systematic approval process, transparent, and so on. Okay, now we talk about old slopes. What do we do with old slopes, as has mentioned? Okay, old doubtful slopes, meaning to say they're built many years ago, not according to the new guidelines. And what about private slopes? The owner refused to strengthen, and that has a danger to the neighbor, danger to the public. What should you do? Next. So this is governments have to pay first. Hong Kong spent about one billion Hong Kong dollars for operations, meaning to say that they beef up to pay the salary of the staff, and so on, and another one billion for strengthening work developments. They call it strengthening work, and one billion is about 0.4 b in Malaysia. So they spent total of nearly a billion ringgit a year, even today. So they registered the new slopes and old slopes, monitor them, and this is called, this is the, what the dangerous suicide order, even to the private owner. Say, look, your slope. But before they issue a danger suicide order, they actually carry out investigation. You can challenge them, fine, but they give you the evidence that your slopes is not stable, and in endangering public, and they demand you to strengthen. Okay, drainage order for leaking services on slope and so on. Next. And maintenance, of course. So in conclusions, cluster developments. And of course, the developer, don't worry about it. They cannot sell. They are very creative. They can find a way if you impose the cluster developments. So we have to do it at this stage, public encouragement rather than imposing uh, set up the centralized body to support all parties, particularly the uh, local authority, and simplify hillside developments. Make it simple that people interpret consistently. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, even though I think uh, Doctor received quite a relatively short notice, but you have a lot to share with us. Very interesting. You can come over and sit beside me. Okay. Um, I think we have about um, slightly about 10 minutes eh, for us to allow for the participants to uh, ask for any further clarification from the, our presenter. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to open to the members of the floor. If you have any uh, questions or any comment uh, to what has been presented by our presenter. Okay. Any questions? No questions? <laughs> yes, yes, please. Uh, please identify yourself and then you can uh, direct your questions to the presenter. Hello, good morning. I'm uh, Omar from FRIM. This is regarding the uh, presentation, which I find it very intriguing, interesting. Uh, one question regarding your recommendation that the development shall be clusterized to cluster of the whole development into one place, I find it a bit difficult to understand because when you cast the whole thing, are you not stressing the same ground further by putting more load? 
whereby if you are to distribute onto the uh, larger space, you are lessening the stress on the soil. Uh, what do you comment about that? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Cikgu So, Doctor, please. Right, thank you. Well, you have two choices. One is that you cut up, open up the whole hill. Class two, class three. Therefore, you could spend a lot of money to strengthen the slope, right? Then you have a lot of area to maintain. Because everywhere you have to, the uh, building, the height is considered very high risk. A bungalows, for particular, or link houses. Usually, in the in the uh, that situation, are mostly for bungalows or semi D. You could cut a whole hill, clear the whole hill. But try to imagine now you develop at the foothill or at the top of the plateau of the hill. 50%, 30% of the area that you actually disturb. So very cost effective to strengthen the slope of that small area behind the slope or in front of the slope. So that's the advantage of cluster development. And leave the difficult one green. And if the, the green area has a danger to the slopes, strengthen them. But you don't cut it. You can still can strengthen them. So that's basically the cluster developments. Uh, instead of, let's say, 100 acres of the land cleared to maintain, to strengthen, very costly. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Ah, yes, please. Good morning. Uh, I'm Razali from Prabhadana Putrajaya. Uh, I would like to share my experience from your presentation. First of all, when you say the causes of failures, because for residential, 60% is design error. And I agree with you because uh, I work as a, when we approve the plan, we notice that uh, actually consultants really is a con. I, frankly speaking, I've been supervising consultants for the past 15 years. Their work is not up to standard, especially when it comes to a earth retaining structure. It was not carried out by a qualified geotechnical engineer. So basically, I'm also a geotechnical engineer. So when I check through the drawings, they just let the young graduates do the design with a standard template. That's why there's a lot of failure. That's why I say in this portion, I think the Board of Engineers and also IEM should play an important role, stressing that all retaining structures and anything uh, earth-related structures should be designed a qualified geotechnical engineer rather than a normal engineer. Uh, that's one thing. And another thing, we have the legislation under the Akta Jalan Parit dan Bangunan. We have the, the earthworks by law. It's clearly stated that any earthwork uh, shall be designed by a qualified engineer and they should check it. So that's, when you say there's, there's no jurisdiction, it's, it's not true. Every authority have to uh, abide by the Akta Jalan Parit dan Bangunan and they have the earthworks by law. The problem is, uh, in small local authorities, like you see like the Hulu Langat case is MPKJ, eh? the engineer is just grade 41. We have no experience at all. So you don't expect them to do it. So unless the government make a policy eh, see, for, for a slopes, although you have the guidelines, if there's no enforcement, no point. Eh? So unless you have a, a board which sits down with anything, earthwork related structures actually with slopes, to a central committee, and this central committee must be a national committee rather than the state. Where every state varies with implementation. Some states are very strict. Some states are very loose in implementation, unless you have that, that body. Maybe CIDB can do it like that, what they did now for the decision of the contractors. Really. So they can do it for all this uh, slope. That's my uh, uh, point. To, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chair Razali. So you are touching on the competency of the designers, huh? the slope designers, the so-called. Okay. okay, Doctor, you will respond. One word to, answer, to uh, add on to your command, mismatch. You know who is the biggest culprit for mismatch? The government agency. Why say that? As I mentioned to you, that that, that collapse that I personally involved, I, not all, many. And the departments of the technical departments of the government has no choice. They, for instance, they have gone through the selection process, say that this ABC is qualify, have the people to do the work, send to the treasury, ABC not is in, they could add up D, E, F, no capacity, and they got a job. 
that project in, in the Para, for instance, Consul architect the first time, engineer the first time, contractors is the first time, never done this before. This is clearly a mismatch. So I think they set a good example. I think this, the, uh, the government should take the lead to say, look, they must be serious. In the private sector, same thing. Yes, agree with you. There are some. But the, uh, because of the uh, so many failures, I think people are slowly waking up. But they're waking up a bit too slow, is it? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Doctor. I'm very sorry I have to cut short the QA because we have another QA after the last session, alright? So anybody that have uh, the question they can you know they can bring up later. Uh, now we are going for our break. So uh, we are already about a quarter past ten. So we'll be coming back somewhere at quarter to eleven. Okay? Would it be fine to everybody? Alright. Thank you very much. <laughs>